All right, guys, welcome back tonight for Birdman Martin's Drug Stories channel. Um, I'm just kind of fuck around a little bit. I got this cool fancy light I forgot about that lights up different colors. So um, I lit it up. I'm do like a, uh, a different looking type video just to fuck around with it. Like just my shadow in the red light. Anyways, doesn't matter. Uh, hit the like and subscribe button. The subscribe button is what does matter. I appreciate all the following people I've gotten. It's been really growing. I, uh, I'm going to be on an addiction page that has 12,000 followers. Um, I'm doing a Zoom interview or story with this website um, on YouTube, doing that on Sunday through a Zoom call. So they have 12,000 followers, and he, he ran into my page, and that gives me uh, all the confidence in the world. But we'll get right into the story. It's not kind of a long introduction. I know what you motherfuckers are here for anyways. And it's not to hear me ramble on about my interview. It's to hear me ramble on about my life and what it was like. When the times were dark and like what it's like now. Where I left off my last story, I had just gotten out of jail after my jail series. And my last story on, on the page was, uh, I basically make a long story short, got out of jail. They mandated me to a year of probation with a sober house completion and drug tests. Um, now the problem was when I got out, I wasn't in a program yet. I had to get into a program once I got out. Um, and typically you have to go through detox to get into a rehab to get into a program. So I kind of had a, a green light if I wanted to kind of use my old schemes and get high for free because, oh, poor me, uh, the government's making me. I have to get high to get treatment or else I don't pass probation. But you know what? Some friends helped me through that and they said, well, if you get high, you fail probation immediately. And that's not going to look good either. You'll go back to jail for like three years. So, um, Make long story short, I ended up getting into a sober house, Michael's house, after staying uh, on a couple of different friends' couches. One of them, his name was a G, and one of them where I first hit up and went to after jail. And then my other really close friend, uh, my brother, till, till the end, um, he, after I ran out of time at G's house, he let me stay there and said, hey, you can stay here the rest of the time if you want, man. Um, don't worry about it. I know you're trying to do good. And, like, I talked to him last night. And I was like, man, you believed in me when, like, I didn't even believe in myself, man. Like, I didn't think I'd be able to stay clean. And, like, you believed I couldn't. had me into your house. And that shit will never be forgotten. I told him that last night. That I got nothing but love for him. This dude has done so much for me. Undeservingly, you know. Or, in my head, I think undeservingly. Anyways, I stayed at, at his house until I got into a program. Um, now, once I got into a program, I got in, it was probably my first week there. Now, my first time ever in like a sober house environment, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, I had a bunch of friends that I reconnected with that were in recovery that kind of let me know the ropes a little bit. And I told them where I was going and they helped me out. And uh, so I went there and I struggled to find a job for some time. I finally got some shit job. I worked it because I had to, you know, pay rent at the sober house and stay clean to so keep, my, keep my probation good. So I did all those things, but immediately, as soon as I get there, probably my first week in the house, so it was a week after I left, left my friend's couches, um, from G's couch to my other buddy's couch to the sober house. A week after that, I fucking get a random Facebook message. Not I got I got blocked by my friend whose couch I slept on. Randomly blocked on Facebook, which is weird. He's not that type to just be blocking people like that. Ain't I mean, in his true color show because he did text me after telling me why he blocked me. He hit me up, you know. I was like, I can't believe what you did, bird. You piece of shit! You fucking, you robbed uh, you robbed G's house. You, you took uh, the, his wedding rings and pawned them. They have all this evidence of you at the pawn shop. Now, mind you, I'm fresh out of jail. I'm scared to death to go back. I haven't gotten high at all. I want to satisfy probation. Definitely don't want to go right back to jail. So, I had no reason to steal anything from his house to begin with. I I had food stamps. I had my last check from before I got arrested that got mailed to there. So I had a little bit of money to get me through. I wasn't like broke, broke. I had food stamps, which I offered him. I even let him borrow $40 um, so he could go out and like, get some blow. And he did pay me back before I left. But after that, when I left a week later, and this took probably a couple years for the truth to come to light. This is what I think. Um, he got really fucking bad into the drugs, like on some like crackhead shit. And he was already going downhill when I was living there. He was doing coke every night, even knowing that I can't do it. Because I'm on probation and I'm about to go to a sober house, I have a drug test around the corner. He was just doing it in front of me or whatnot, but hell, he's letting me stay there. I had no other option. I was very appreciative of that. But on the flip side, he's doing mad coke like right in front of me. But whatever, I was pretty determined. I got through it uh, somehow. It was a very dangerous situation. I was able to get through it. 
Once I got through it, he, uh, well, I think is he pawned his own rings and then pinned it on his wife, who already hated me from high school because I graduated in her class, that he pawned his own rings and then pinned it on me because I'd already moved out. So he obviously pawned his own rings, went out and got more drugs, got high, got all fucked up, and so I can just pin it on Bird, fuck him. And uh, people were hitting me up left and right. My boy, whose house I stayed at after G's house, and he was disgusted when I'm pleading my innocence with him, bro. And he didn't really want to hear it at the time because they made it seem like I had done it. It was like uh, the framing of Roger Rabbit, but it was the framing of Dirty Bird. And they fucking tried framing me, and I pleaded my innocence, and he didn't listen to it. Only months and months went by where he hit me up because he saw the direction that, that G was going down, which was not good. And it made sense to him that I was actually telling the truth. Now, this is one of the many situations where it's like the boy who cried wolf, you know? Um, I'd done so much grimy shit to those people that helped me all through my past that I was an easy victim to say, hey, he did it, because no one's going to believe me. I'm fresh out of jail. Before jail, I was overdosing multiple times a day. I was in a coma all these times, so no one's going to believe the fucking local junkie over this dude, who at one time had you know, a decent amount of respect on the street. But since then, his life had fallen off, so he pawned his own rings, and then I think... I think even his wife hit me up like on Facebook and then blocked me like with pictures of the rings like these are the rings and they have they have your they told me they have your picture at the police state at the pawn shop and we're going to call the cops. Now mind you I hadn't done any of this so obviously if I hadn't done it hadn't gone to the pawn shop didn't give them my ID which you need at the pawn shop I know that like I'm a fucking drug addict I know what the pawn shop rules are lady and uh, I was so fucking frazzled I'm like oh my god if they even say that I did this to the police, even though it's not true, I'm on probation, I'm going back to jail until they figure this shit out, and it would not be good for me, automatic violation right off the bat, you know, for stealing from the people who let me stay in their house, but I hadn't done it, it was the craziest fucking situation, I knew I hadn't done it, what I did was, I wasn't working yet, I was new to a sober house, I went and took a couple bucks I had, and took the bus, down to the pawn shop that they said it was at. And I went there, like, with my ID. I'm like, hey, I told them the story, and they looked into it on the computer and on their files, and they had no record of it, which I knew they'd have no record of it. I was just wondering if someone had maybe had one of my old IDs from years ago. You know, you always use the ID to sniff coke, so I've lost IDs in plenty of people's cars. Who knows who might have an old ID of mine that could frame me? And uh, that's what I was thinking happened, so I went there to try to clear my name. But they had no record of anything, which was fishy because these people were so determined that they had this specific pawn shop and they're going to the police. And I'm telling them I didn't do it, but I found out why they never even went to the police or whatever. And this was probably over a year later. I kind of put all the dots together. This dude was so fucked up on the drugs. He stole his own wedding rings, pawned it, and blamed me for it. Now, mind you, I'm nervous as hell because if I get violated or even accused of a crime, I'm going back to jail for three years or at least until they figure out I didn't do it, which could be months. The court systems aren't quick. If you've never been in court before, I don't know what you're doing on my channel. But if you've never been in court before, it's not a quick process. And so right off the bat, I have all this adversity my first week in the sober house. You know, my natural reaction as a drug addict is shit, poor me. Um, they're going to falsely accuse me. I'm going back to jail and I'm innocent. I might as well go get high. And uh, thankfully, within that first week, I had gotten my first sponsor ever through uh, AA. And uh, it's my boy from my hometown, which was not recommended, but I was comfortable with him. He had some clean time. I really respected his program, what he was doing. I thought he could help me. And he did on this day for sure. Like, I was ready to go out and get high, and he like kind of talked me off the ledge. So, you know, you have to believe that the truth will come out and you'll be okay. If that's the truth, it'll come out eventually. And it did. Uh, never, no charges came from it. It would have been bullshit. Anyways, this dude pawned his own shit. Everybody knows it now, you know. But I get it, man. He was fucked up on drugs and had a, an easy target, which would be me. And if I was fucked up on drugs and I had an easy target to get high for free, I'm not going to lie. If I'm, if I'm actively using, I'm going to take that. You know, I'm going to fucking get high and fuck the next person, you know. But I wasn't living like that no more. I was trying to make these changes. I was dedicated to God. I was praying every day, which I still pray every day in the morning for guidance and protection. I started praying in jail, in the jail cell by myself when I had nobody else left, you know. I burned all my bridges and I turned to God out of desperation, to be honest. But I'm so glad I did because, you know, since I came back to him, he's never let me down since he protected and guided me this whole ride. Miracle after miracle have worked out in my life. Like, my fiance and I have a, our own small personal business. Like, what the fuck? I'm a fucking junkie 
I got a fucking business now. I'm clean. I go to work. Like, you know, I, I'm getting married. I have two rescue kittens. Like, what the fuck? Those are all miracles. Those miracles are brought to me from God because I found them in the jail cell when I was desperate. And I've never forgotten that. I've never stopped doing it because it's worked. And when I don't pray to God for help in the morning, that means that I'm steering the ship. And if I'm steering the ship, it usually goes off track into like the Titanic and we sink. And you have to start your life over again. Each relapse worse than the last. Um, but with God, I haven't had to come across that, thankfully, you know. <laughs> so I got falsely accused of it. Not only that, when I got falsely accused of it, my other friend who, the second house I stayed at before I got into the program, who let me stay there as long as I needed until I got into the program because he knew I was trying to do good, had a next door neighbor that lived across the street. And she, after I moved out of there, was jumping on the fuck bird bandwagon because all the rumors are going out about that fake shit about the wedding rings. And she goes, yeah, he probably did do it. I saw him. I saw him on your porch one day when you were at, when you were at work and he was doing drugs, which is like the craziest shit. Like, fucking, I'm getting drug tested. I'm not going back to jail. I wasn't doing drugs. Like, as soon as I got out of jail, like, what the fuck? I wouldn't do that. It was just another false accusation, which at the time put the pieces together like I had done bad things, but that also was vindicated down the line as well. The truth always comes to light, whether it's good or bad. And you just gotta have faith. It might not come to light right away. It might not come on your schedule, but the truth always comes to fucking light. So I got I got through that. And then another time I was at the sober house where I was really close to it getting high was I had in the middle of the night fucking got got up and went to the bathroom i felt lightheaded i ended up passing out on my way to the bathroom like i had a panic attack or blood pressure or something i randomly passed out when i woke up i went to my roommate i'm like yo i woke him up it's the middle of the night I, was like, oh, I just passed out i feel lightheaded i don't know what to do so they called an ambulance i went down there and uh whatever like i was fine and when i got out i knew i was going back to the sober house like i knew they're gonna drug test me like you can't pass out in the middle of the night and not expect to be drug tested at a sober house. This is a, you know, legitimate place. And uh, I got back and they tested me. I, I was sleeping. I woke up. I took the test. I went back to sleep. When I went back to sleep, 10 minutes later, the house manager is there like, hey, we need to talk to you downstairs. And he goes, you've been smoking spice, man? I said, smoking spice? What the fuck is spice? What the hell is that? He's a K2 synthetic marijuana. I said, I said, no, I was at the hospital. I said, if I was going to relapse, I wouldn't be on weed. And if I was going to smoke weed, I wouldn't smoke fake weed that you can get at the fucking Hindu Mart on the corner. You know, I would go do some real shit if I was going to do that. And uh, he didn't really believe it. No one believed it because their little drug test said that I'd failed for, uh, for K2. But I was dead set against that. I pleaded with the house director who could have kicked me out right there on the spot just for that, just for anything. He could have just said, that's what the test says, you're out. But I pleaded with him. He must have seen in my eyes that I was telling the truth and gave me a chance. He said... If you pay for your own lab drug testing for this test, if you pay for it out of your pocket with your work money and it comes back and you're telling the truth and you it was a bad test and you were clean, um, at that point, we'll take that $40 that the drug test costs and we'll knock it off your rent. But if it comes back again that you're dirty with the lab test, then you're definitely dirty. There's no hiding that. And then you obviously don't get the 40 back and you're kicked out and have to call your probation officer. And of course, the drug lab wasn't that quick. It took probably about a week to 10 days before they got the results. So I'm on pins and needles for nine, 10 days, fresh in recovery. All this drama's going on. I'm trying to do well. And, uh, you know, like anything else, I talked to my sponsor at the time again. I was like, I might as well get high because they're saying I got high and I didn't. So I'm going back to jail. Anyways, I might as well go get high. And again, he talked me off the ledge. A similar situation as uh, a few weeks or months prior with the with the ring incident you know a similar type situation panned out and again the truth came to light um it came back in and man, my my house uh my house manager the director called me i was on my way to an AA meeting with my roommate he goes your drug test came in and i was like waiting on this call for like over a week i'm like yeah i was so nervous not nervous like i don't know what the fuck the rules of the drug tests are i don't fucking know what can pop up and, and like how it works you know, I know I didn't do it, but if the test says that my system is fucked up, then I'm going to jail. And uh, he goes, you f it came back, you failed, and I just stopped. My heart stopped. And then right away, he, he's like, just kidding. It came back clean, and it came back clean, and he was just fucking with me. I went to the meeting, and I continued on my road to recovery, you know. And through a sober house, I, those were a couple incidents I had where I almost got high early on 
in my uh, in my recovery because in the old me would have gotten high each and every time. I would the old me would have gotten high as soon as I got out of jail and they told me to get to a program I have to go get treatment. I'd be like, well, I have to get high to get into treatment. I would have taken that ticket, but I didn't. I found a way. And I got help, you know, from people that probably God sent me certain people, and. Uh, and then after that, with the wedding ring thing, I, I knew I hadn't done it. It was fucked up. And I was like, I'm being framed by somebody. I had no idea who at the time. Um, but I got through and the truth came to light. Same thing with the with the K2 uh, synthetic marijuana test. I got through all those tests. And there's many, many other tests and stories like within like that time at the Silver House. Um, these are just ones that kind of hang my hat on. And when I look back, uh, are most memorable, like the turning points all the time. You know, I could have gone off track right away early on into it but somehow he didn't and uh that's due to prayer and due to doing recovery with my sponsor at the time um that's due to many things but none of the things were me um i just tried doing what i felt was right and that's what i do to this day you know now i, I take care of my fiance we have the business going i have two rescue kittens i mean my life has turned into a fucking dream. And I remember so many nights being homeless and dope sick, thinking that my life is a nightmare. And what am I still doing here on earth? Because <laughs> fuck this shit. You know what I mean? And uh, God didn't take me, man. I, I tried overdosing myself. I, I did. And I kept waking up in the hospital. They kept bringing me back to life. And at the time, I said, why do you keep bringing me back to life? My life is even more fucked up now after this. And uh, everything comes to light. Why well, I survived all those things to do good in the world and make up for all the bad things I've done. And that's what I try doing today. Um, with the candle business, I donate two bucks from each candle sale to that sober house that I'm talking about in this series. Um, so my first 50 bucks last week on it. And uh, it felt so good to give back. Not that 50 bucks is a ton of money for them, but fuck it. It's more than they had before I sent it. And I always said when I left there that I was going to get my life together and give back. But everybody says that shit. And few actually do it. So I'm, I'm one of the blessed ones, one of the lucky ones. I still has a chance to chase his dreams, you know. And uh, I look forward to the interview coming up uh, Sunday on the uh, other YouTube channel with 12,000 subscribers. Uh, his name is Shine, uh, Shane Reinhardt. Um, Shane Reinhardt, and he's got a page with 12,000 viewers, and I can't wait to be on it and spread the message of hope. Bird Gang out. We'll continue the Sober House stories on my next video. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, motherfucker. Try and get paid.